super excited to uh, welcome up Jen Long here. She's a design manager at Slack, um, also a former veteran designer at Google for many years. Um, she's been uh, someone I've admired for, for, for many years. I think we met back at so maybe Stanford at the maybe Designer Fair, like 2010 or something like that. So it's been cool to uh, follow her career. And um, she's also um, built some of her own products as a designer and founder as well. So really excited to, to welcome her up. So please give Jen a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Today, hi, my name is Jen. And I'm the design manager for the enterprise group at Slack. And I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about the business impact of design because I feel like my whole life I've been trying to make this case for the business impact of design and we're finally here. So I feel really honored and privileged to be talking about this together. So enterprise, the most exciting of all <laughs> topics and the most exciting business unit at Slack, right? That's what you think of. You think of messaging and enterprise, not really. So. Many of you do use Slack, and I'm guessing that you, you what, what comes to mind, messaging with your teammates, emojis, culture building, things like this. But Slack's actually in the middle of a profound shift in the way that we're thinking about our business, and our founders have been thinking about this for a long time, in terms of us being enterprise-grade software, where the world's biggest companies come to work, and the majority of the work happens inside of Slack, and that's a far cry from where it started, which is teams of say 10 to 100 people all working together. We're talking now about companies like IBM that have hundreds of thousands of people on a Slack team. So my job and my team is responsible for helping Slack scale from a user perspective, security, everything that goes into making something enterprise grade. And this is, this is our team. So I like to think of our team as a merry band of outsiders. None of us have enterprise experience. We've all been in the consumer world. And as a hiring manager, this is not on paper the team that you would say, go build the enterprise software product. You would be like, you know, basically it doesn't quite make sense. We have the creative director of Tumblr. We have folks who have growth experience. Rose, who we're gonna feature in a second, Ernest. We have a game designer. All these different people have come together to form the enterprise team, but I actually love it because I feel like we don't take any of the tropes of enterprise software, the difficulties, um, we don't take them lying down. We actually challenge, we question, we keep pushing forward. Basically a consumer level friendly product that works at scale. This is Rose, she's here in the audience today. Hi Rose. Everybody right. um, and I also love this picture because well, I just had a baby, and while I was out on maternity leave, my team, they had this whole photo shoot where they kind of did like a satirical enterprise kind of like stock photo <laughs> shoot, and I got to check in on Slack and see that they were doing this, and I feel like this is our team in a nutshell. We're enterprise, but not. So, back to our story for tonight. Uh, the way nine months ago, when this happened, the enterprise group was organized. There was an adoption. There was a sub-team that was called adoption, a sub-team called value. Rose and, the call, and Colin, the PM, they were on adoption. And we started noticing retention rates were a little lower than we would have liked. Even compared with regular large teams, they were a little lower than we wanted. Now, we had a lot of hypotheses. Why could this be? Um, maybe it's because you have multiple workspaces. That's one of the defining features of Enterprise Grid. You have an org which is your company, and then there's a whole bunch of little teams, there we go, inside the org. Um, maybe it's because at the time we didn't have an informed perspective on how to roll out something like Enterprise Grid. We said, hey, make it, you know, organize it the way you organize your company. It doesn't have to be that structured. And over time, we saw, no, actually when we get involved and we help you organize your team, your organization, it's almost like doing good urban planning. That's the best practice. So maybe that's it. Maybe, that's, maybe there's not enough thought going into the design. Maybe it's the fact that for enterprise companies, they live in a very fractured landscape compared with some of the smaller teams. You oftentimes, with IBM, which is one of our lar largest customers, you see that they have all these different communication tools. Not one is blessed over the other. Maybe one is preferred, say there's Skype, there's Yammer, there's all these different tools. But folks, especially as we're getting into non-technical factions, they're using all different tools at all different times. And Slack was just one of those tools. Um, so maybe, maybe some of these things were going on. Then, you know, once again, thinking about retention, why do we have these retention problems? 
the normal thing, quote unquote, normal thing you'd do is you'd say, okay, let's do, let's do a user study. Let's do some qualitative research. Let's take a look at the logs. Let's see where people are dropping off. Let's do an analysis. Let's, let's talk to sales. Now, we were a new product. We had just launched. We didn't have a user researcher. We didn't have an experimentation framework. Couldn't do an A-B test. We didn't have anyone doing data or analytics. We have a sales team, which this is true for all enterprise, and this is one of the big learnings about working in the enterprise space. Due to the sales cycle and the high numbers that they're all using all the time, there's a high sensitivity with sales in terms of us talking to the customer. They do not want us to just go in and speak with the customers. It's very, very sensitive. So what do we do? What would you do? So you can go speak to the customer, but how would you do it? Sales says, stand back. This is a really tricky renewal cycle. I don't want you talking to our customers right now. <laughs> yes, befriend the sales team. Yes, yes. Anybody else? What's up? Invite the customer, yourselves. The sales team would kill you. They would totally kill you. You might get fired. Strategery, yes, we got the sales team, we got the PM, we got CSMs, all the sales adjacent orgs, getting everybody together. Who in, out of our customer base, wants to feel like they're a pioneer? Who wants to feel like they're collaborating with Slack? Whose leadership team would be really into that idea? Who's not in the middle of a renewal cycle? Who likes us, but maybe doesn't love us? So they're not, you know, retention's not going perfectly, so they might have something to say, but they're not in a sensitive situation where we're going to get in trouble for talking to the customer. And not only that, you have to, it's still so sensitive, even when we found these four different companies that we could do research with, we had to get on a plane, and when I say we, I mean Rose, Colin, and the account executive, you have to get on a plane all together. You can't, as, as a designer and PM, you're not necessarily trusted, you have to work together. This has to be a strategic initiative. They have to go in, set up the meeting, and then we start to do the interview. And once again, by we, I mean Rose and Colin. So they put together a script, and they interviewed four customers. And later, we did have a researcher join our team, and she said that this was some of the best design-led research that she'd ever seen. That this script actually mapped to what she would have done. So it was really, really great. They put a lot of time and thought into this, and they were very strategic about their engagement, and they worked with sales every step of the way. Uh, so coming out of these interviews, coming out of this research, there's a couple things, a couple themes. Uh, there's a product education gap. Slack, even for people who use it all the time, can be quite complex. Um, almost every single customer for enterprise, they have written up their own, um, basically, how to use Slack guide internally, and it's extensive. They have channels, they have forums, they have classes. This is not some product, product that's easy to use. That's not a sign of a usable product. That's the sign of a really complicated product and a complicated ecosystem, because there's SSO, even logging into Slack is very difficult at the world's largest companies. Also, people were in the wrong place. So a workspace is what you probably call a team. At the world's largest companies, most people would just get an email, asking them to join, they'd come to a page that I'll show you in a second and they wouldn't know where to go. So they just picked the team that had the most people and there they were. But that wasn't necessarily the right place. So they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing there. And then, even when they didn't know where to go, they knew they were in the wrong place, they didn't know how, and even the admin sometimes didn't know how to get them in the right place. So lots of problems, lots of problems that we could solve. Maybe we take a stab at it and we do custom onboarding. Maybe there's in-product ed education. That's one way to go. Maybe you improve how you invite people into a workspace. That would be impactful. So I think when we're, when we're talking about the business impact of design, picking which problem you're gonna solve is really important. Because if you go back here, all of these are valid problems. They're all great. Solving each one of these things will meet a major user need. They all have different levels of expense and they all um, will have different outcomes. Now, what we ended up doing was thinking about this people being in the wrong place. Now that seems fixable and that seems like a critical piece to you, um, to retaining users, keeping you going with your team. You have to be in the right place with the right people. And the way that you might solve that 
is through something as simple as a landing page. Maybe you make a better landing page. So before you get this email, sign on to Grid, great. Okay, join a team. And then a lot of times, you'd come to this page where you couldn't see anything. So that's one problem that we were talking about before. The, the default workspace was what we called unlisted. You just couldn't see any workspaces and an admin had to ask, add you. Now maybe you could see a bunch of workspaces. Workspaces, even though these are sort of jokey names, they basically are named things that don't make much sense. They don't match to your business unit. They don't match to anything that you would identify as your team. So once again, you're like, that's not great. After, still sending an email. So we go through this whole design exercise. We decide to do the landing page. We talk about what, what we can do here to help folks without making a huge investment but having a lot of impact. We start thinking, okay, the email has to exist. You have to have an email. There has to be a provisioning system. But what if we helped you find your team by having you type in a coworker's name or a boss's name and doing a human-centric onboarding? What if we help these basically if you, you're gonna be in the same team as your boss, you're gonna be in the same team as someone who sits next to you, only at the exec level might you be in a different workspace. So, quickly, wants to play, you find your workspace, type in the name of the person, maybe it's your boss, and then you see the workspaces that they're in. All of a sudden, folks started getting in the right place. But, this is a nuanced story, because it actually only improved retention by 8%. How could that be? That's a horrible number. <laughs> like why, after all of this that we went through and all of these um, uncovering the user needs, why wasn't that number higher? And I think there, there's a number of different reasons. Um, the complexity, so retention over time has continued to trend up. It just didn't trend up right away. Um, we have done other things to help design or structure in a better way, so it's not just going through this flow. This is almost what we use now as like a failure state. If you're not put in the right place, then you can go through this flow. But we still don't have an experimental framework. We still need to dig into why this number is 8%, and we need to do more work here. However, this is the interesting part. Um, as we started talking to sales and thinking about the outcome even when the numbers that you're tracking aren't necessarily as high as you'd like them to be, all of a sudden, this is a huge strategic contact for us at IBM. Um, at IBM, there's seven people who work full-time as admins on Slack, and this is their head admin. See, that's how you know it's easy tool. Seven full-time admins. Um, but it's, it's also a social tool, so there's, there's complexity built in. Um, they were really happy, but then more importantly, a customer like Capital One, which we were using, you know, they're highly regulated, we were using them as a reference, basically they felt like they were strategic pioneers, just like we had hoped, and over time, between these two companies, because Rose, Colin, and the AE had gone on site with them just for that visit, they now have unlocked hundreds of thousands of seats, and Rose can put tens of millions of dollars next to her name because they feel like they are part of Slack. They feel like they are a trusted, almost like um, collaborative consultant in our user interface and in our experience. So by keeping this relationship with sales going, by continuing to talk to them, they, it had that much impact that they feel like this was, especially for the Capital One deal, a pivotal moment in the relationship between themselves and Slack. And so I just encourage everybody to continue thinking more broadly about the impact because if you just looked at the 8%, which is what I initially did, I said, what's going on? We need to improve the design. And that absolutely is true, but that will always be true for design. You will always want to improve it. However, making, getting on the plane, making these strategic investments with sales and understanding what they think is important and delivering on that from a design perspective, now you have in Rose's resume, ARR in the tens of millions of dollars for this one feature. So, a couple of takeaways. As much as you can, even if it feels expensive if you're working in a small startup, get on a plane with your PM. If you're, you can get your engineer on a plane, bless you, and your account executive, get those folks on a plane and go and meet with your customers. Even if you're in these highly regulated space, find the customer that they will let you talk to. It will pay dividends. Second one, 
And I struggled how to say this about sales, but basically, if you don't have a user researcher, sales is your best friend. That is the next best thing. They're talking to customers every single day and make sure that they're talking to you and that you understand the stories that they're telling to the customers because that is a part of the design. And I think when I worked in the consumer space, I didn't understand that as much as the enterprise space. And then once again, know your ARR. Every designer who I interview, when they have ARR on their, on their resume, when they have it on their LinkedIn, I automatically pay attention. I sit up, I look, and I think this is somebody who is paying attention. They're paying attention to their impact. So add those numbers, do your homework, and figure out what your ARR is. What's ARR? <laughs> Annual recurring revenue. Yeah, the money. Know how much money <laughs> you are making your business. And even if you can't, even if you don't know, approximate it, try to figure out, do that legwork, and I promise you, you will be a more interesting candidate to hire. Thank you.